Merciful God, our Savior, we come today, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Just grateful, Lord God, for the time that you have given us. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless us, Lord God, as we have come this morning to celebrate who you are in our lives. We thank you because you are wonderful, and indeed you're worthy of our praise. So, Lord God, speak to our hearts today through the song, Lord God, and through your word, that through it all, you might get the praise, the honor, and all of the glory. For it's in the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray, and for thy tender mercy and sake. Amen, 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 and praise the Lord again. What a blessing and a joy to be able to speak God's word into your heart today that you might continue to be encouraged during this, this time of pestilence in the world. The dominant emotion that is gripping the hearts of everyone throughout the world today is fear. But yet, interestingly enough, even in the darkest time, God always spoke these words to God hard. He said, fear not. Fear not. Fear not, he said. And it's very interesting because fear not actually appears, for those who count, <laughs> about 63 times throughout the Bible. Because God is trying to tell us something. For God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. So it's not God's will that we should be gripped with fear. You see, fear is such a basic human emotion that many of us constantly live in the grip of fear, worry, and anxiety. But God says to all of that, fear not. For the believer in Jesus Christ, fear is the opposite of faith. Faith cannot operate where there is fear, and fear cannot operate where there is faith. It is as light and darkness one has to leave. And so the word of God will drive fear far away from us. So what do we do when our fear seems to be winning the day? What if you pray? And feel that God still hasn't come through for you. If you're like most people, you begin to lose hope. And you wonder why you even bother to pray in the first place. Deep, deep in the soil of our heart, little seeds of doubt have started to take root. Growing up into a harvest of frustration and fear. But somewhere in all of our thinking as believers in Jesus Christ, God has to figure into the equation. Today I want to kind of use the life of Abraham to illustrate that simple truth that God is always in the middle of it all. And in order to get the context, we have to go back about 40 centuries to a place called Ur of the Chaldees, which was a large city on the Euphrates River we see that Abraham is first known as Abram, and later his name is changed to Abraham as the story unfolds. When we first are introduced to Abraham, he's about 75 years old, which in those days would be considered middle-aged. Abraham is a prosperous businessman who is no doubt well known to many people. He and his wife Sarah of course, initially known as Sarai, have no children. And it is against that backdrop that God speaks to Abram for the first time, and all of this is recorded in Genesis chapter 12. We see in verses 1 and 2 that the Lord said to Abram, Get up and leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And I will make, a, make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. Later, God promised to give Abraham many descendants, so many that God said they would be like the dust of the earth. But 10 years passed, and this was recorded in Genesis chapter 13, verse 16. About 10 years quickly passed without any sign of any children. By now, Abraham is almost 85 years old, and Sarah, the Bible records, is far beyond bearing children. 
But God did not seem to be in any hurry to give him this child that he had promised. And even though God had blessed Abraham to win a great victory recorded in Genesis chapter 14, yet nothing could satisfy Abraham's deep desire for a son. He wondered, I can imagine, how much longer will I have to wait? Why is God delaying acting upon his promise? Has God changed his mind? Was there some other problem that Abraham didn't know about? Maybe Abraham and Sarah had sinned. Were they doing something displeasing to God? Why is God closing up Sarah's womb? If God had promised, why was it taking him so long to fulfill the promise? So Abraham and Sarah decided to go to plan B. Like many of us, when we pray and it doesn't happen, we then take matters into our own hands. And so Abraham goes into his maid servant, Haggai, and brings forth a son. But he was not the son of the promise. So Abraham is doubting what God had promised him. And fear begins to grip his heart. So God, in the midst of Abraham's doubt, God moves. After this, the word of the Lord comes to Abraham in a vision. And we read in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. And that's what I want to talk about today, just for a few minutes. God is your shield. Fear not. I am your shield. Fear not. I try to think of some reasons why Abraham's heart would be gripped with fear. And why would Abraham doubt the promise that God had given him, even though many years had gone by? One, Abraham considered himself. Abraham said, I'm an old man now. No way that God would move in my life to bring forth a son now. Not at this point. Many years had passed since God had given him the promise. So maybe God changed his mind. You know how it is when we pray to God for something and it doesn't happen quick, fast, and in a hurry. We move on because we die. Abraham also considered that in the history of mankind, nothing like this had ever happened before. And to reinforce it, to put a period behind this doubt, Sarah also doubted God's promise. So when you and I, being very human, when we step back from Abraham's life and we begin to, to, to reason uh, through what has happened in his life, uh, we can't find any reason for this not to have happened except God's will. God's will. God had promised Abraham that it was God's will that Abraham would have this son. And to reassure him that God had not changed his mind. God had not forgotten the promise he made to Abraham. In fact, God tells Abraham, you are not operating on my time. And no man can cause God to act apart from their faith. So God answers Abraham's question of why so long. God says, I am your shield. I am your shield. Well, that doesn't quite carry any significance to us today. But think back to the days of Abraham about a shield. A shield was not what we see on television where the soldier has it and it basically protects uh, his vital area. But a shield actually stretched from the head to the toe and completely protected the soldier in every way. And such a shield offers complete protection from every attack of the enemy. You see, to call God our shield means that God is going to protect you 
even in the time of the coronavirus, even in the midst of your doubts, God has got your back and God is going to rescue you in the midst of this danger. Notice God didn't say, I will give you a shield. God said, I am your shield. The very God of heaven says that he will be our shield, which means that we have a shield that is omnipotent, universal, and eternal. That shield, hear me now, cannot be defeated because the shield is God himself. And when God moves, there is none other like him. You and I cannot be in any better position than to be in Christ Jesus. Because who can defeat us? What can stand against us when God himself is our shield? No weapon, he said, formed against us, he spoke through Isaiah, will prosper. And if God be for us, then who or what can be against us? The message is certainly clear. Not if God, but since God is your shield, fear not. Fear not. Let not your heart be gripped with fear. Neither should you be afraid. If it wasn't so, God would have told you. God said, I am your shield. You know, it's been said that a believer in Christ Jesus is immortal until his work is done on earth. That statement right there means nothing, that nothing can harm you except God allows it. Not even cancer, coronavirus, not bankruptcy, not theft, not physical disability, not the loss of your job, not a terrible accident, not a death of a child, not any of a thousand other sorrows that afflict the children of God. But I don't want you to get the wrong message because we aren't immune to sadness. What happens to others also happens to us. But the difference is this. We know that God protects us from harm so that nothing can touch us that doesn't first pass through his sovereign will. God has a will for your life. And only what God wills can happen to you. That knowledge doesn't mean that we don't weep or we don't suffer. Far from it. But what is the basis of that statement? You see, we sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. Our sorrow is different precisely because we hope in Christ Jesus. So who can defeat us when God is our shield, our very present help? Our God is a shield around his people and nothing but which God allows, which brings us back to the central issue. So why did God wait so long to give Abraham a son? He was 75 years old when God first spoke to him, and 10 years later, being 85 years old, when God said, fear not. After all these years, God still wasn't ready to move according to the prayer that Abraham had lifted up. Abraham was old, but he would be older yet before Isaac was born. In fact, Abraham was 100 years old when God gave him that son. Can you imagine Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 when God moved? Of all the questions that plagued the people of God, nothing is so vexing as the question of a prayer that we believe goes unanswered. You see, I know God loves me, and God has a plan and a will for my life. But then why does God take so long to answer my deepest, most heartfelt prayers? Right now, people are praying with all their heart, their soul, and their might that God would move this battle. Why is God not answering? Let me tell you, there is an answer. From Abraham's experience, let me tell you. First thing that God is trying to work in our lives is to develop perseverance. To put it very simply, God could, at the snap of a finger, remove the coronavirus. Not only could God do that, 
But here's what would happen to God who suddenly removed the coronavirus, which God himself did not bring into existence. We would take God for granted. And our faith would be so shallow. We develop many godly qualities as we patiently wait on the Lord. Like Abraham, God is saying to us today, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And I shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You see, when God moves, sometimes we have to decide whether we want to give God the glory or whether we want to take the credit. But one thing about it, when God moves, there's no doubt that it's God and God alone and only God gets the glory. See, when Paul wrote about Abraham's story, he said this, without weakening in his faith, he, Abraham, faced the fact that his body was as good as dead at 75 years old and that Sarah's womb was dead. Yet he did not stagger at the promise through unbelief, but was strengthened in his faith, being fully persuaded that what God had promised, God would perform. God has not changed. God has promised you and I. He said, fear not, for I will see you safely through. He hasn't changed his mind. The same God that delivered and strengthened Abraham is the same God that is with you and I right now. He hasn't gone anywhere. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, fear not, for I am your sheep. I will walk through you. I will be with you. Not only did Abraham wait 25 years for an answer to his prayer, he also had to suffer the humiliation of his own failed scheme with Hagar. Immediately after God spoke to him in Genesis 15, he agreed with Sarah to allow him to sleep with the maidservant Hagar in hope of conceiving a child. It's called helping God out a little bit. And it worked. They had a son named Ishmael. But this short-sighted attempt to help God out backfired and brought sadness and heartache to everyone that was involved. That's how you know it wasn't of God. God often delays his answer so that we will have plenty of opportunity to fail using our own resources and our own understanding. That's what we're seeing playing out right here in our nation. They do not seek the wisdom of God. Let him ask him say, last wisdom. Let him ask of God who gives liberally. Instead, everybody wants to be the smarty pants and show that they can defeat this thing all on their own. We can't even get people to stay six feet from each other, much less come with the solution. When God acts, when God acts, it demonstrates that God alone is responsible responsible for answering our prayers and that he alone then gets the glory to deepen our trust in God. God wants us to grow deeper in our love and our confidence in him. When you read Hebrews chapter 11, you notice that of all the characters that it lists, those people of faith, Abraham gets more space there than any other Old Testament hero. He is the preeminent man of faith in the Bible. When we read Abraham's story and see how long he waited, 25 years, we began to gain a new perspective on our own situation. We've only been at this for a few weeks. So as with Abraham, waiting is not bad if it causes you and I to deepen our trust in God. God's answer to fear is not an argument. It's not a formula. It's a person, and his name is Jesus. That's why God said to Abraham, Fear not, I am your shield. God himself is the answer to every fear of the human heart. So let me ask you, have you ever wondered why God called himself by the name I am in the Old Testament? Above all else, I am means that God is eternally existent and therefore all creation depends on him. God stands alone, there being none like unto him. 
No one can be compared to God. He is complete in himself. God doesn't need me. At the end of the day, God doesn't need me. I always make the example that, that God is like the ventriloquist. I am but the dummy. It's God who speaks through me. So, at the end of the day, don't be enamored with the dummy. Listen to the Lord and trust in him. We desperately need him. I want you to think of it this way. To say that God is the great I am means that when we come to him, it means that God is everything we need at exactly that moment. It's as if God is saying to all of us today, I am your strength. I am your courage. I am your help. I am your hope, your supply, your defender. I am your forgiveness, your joy, and I am your future. God is saying to you and to me right now, I am whatever you need me to be. I am the all-sufficient God for every crisis. Because at the end of the day, God wants us to move from fear to faith. Faith focuses on God, not on the problem. Faith trusts in God's timing, not in my own. So many of our struggles with fear start right here. Deep down, we fear that God has somehow made a mistake in his dealings with us. Even though we may have seen many remarkable answers to prayer, the one thing that means the most to us has not been granted. Faith grows by believing God in spite of what's happening today. Faith obeys God one step, one day, one moment at a time. No matter what happens, we are to trust in the Lord. That's faith that rises above circumstances to lay hold of the eternal promise of God. God said, I just want you to map up with the wings of an angel, of an eagle. Fear not, you are the child of God. You see, none of us know what today brings for any of us. Who knows if we all will make it through today or this next week or the next two weeks. But our God is faithful to keep every one of his promises. Nothing can happen to any of us except it first passes through the sovereign will of God. If your way is dark, keep on believing. God, God is always your shield. He will never fail us as we go through this virus. We need not be afraid. We cannot lose. God has already won the battle of life already for us. He will never fail us, and he will see us safely through. For the Lord thy God will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will keep thee. The Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail you, neither forsake you. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? And why should my heart be lonely and long forever? And oh, when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he, is I.
Let not your heart be troubled. Is in the word I And I see.